my first reason I will call it political. Um, when I see certain businesses in Ghana from other parts of the world doing very well, I'm inspired, but at the same time, I'm worried. So if you see China Mall, you're looking at a colony. So if somebody can come all the way from China to come and establish a mall in Ghana and, put, and call it China Mall. All these restaurants we're calling Thai restaurants, Chinese restaurants, they, they are actually countries exporting their products to our country. And we love them, we celebrate them. And when I look at them, I ask myself, do we have a Ghana mall in China? Do we have Ghana restaurants around the world? Oh yeah, they are. They are. So, is, is there a concerted effort to export our products, to export our dishes, to export the things we do around the world? So that's my primary motivation, to build a business that can go around the world and also make a name for Ghana. Then my secondary motivation is that food is a, is a product that is consumed by everybody. I mean, whether you're broke, whether you have money, you're certainly going to eat. So I'm looking for a business that uh, can reach, that has scalability, that can reach more people, that has a larger market size. So that's my motivation for getting into food. I'll come to the other things you do, but let me just ask you for purposes of our uh, listeners and viewers, what will be the one differentiating thing of your restaurant from the others that will be available? What, what's the one big thing that you think will be unique about it? Well, I say that even though we are running a restaurant, we are running it with a hotel mindset. I love hotels. Hotels give you a relaxing environment where you can think, you can brainstorm, you can feel comfortable and not even feel like rushing off to go home. So I tell my people that even though we are running a restaurant, I want us to run it with a hotel mindset. Let's create an environment that will make people forget that they have to leave. So let's create a relaxing environment. Let's make people comfortable. Let's make people enjoy our space. So we are not just selling food. Our, our, our USP is in, three, is in three parts. First, to serve delicious garden food at home quality level. So you know sometimes you go to restaurants and you eat things like fufu. It doesn't feel like people at home. It sounds, the soup even feels foreign. But I want people to come and eat food that they, 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 they would have loved to cook at home, but don't have the time to cook. So it must be quality African food. And then we must give, treat our people well. So there must be a certain concerted effort to make people feel respected, welcome, welcoming. And I say, it begins right from the car park. So whoever is receiving guests at the park, car park must understand the philosophy of the business. It's called NEJ. Even though it's a coinage of my wife and my name, and I'm in Jeremiah, it's also to represent happiness. So people should be happy coming to our business. And then suddenly we must have a great ambience. So we are trying to create a hotel experience in a restaurant. I think that you, I think you should, and this is free consultancy. <laughs> I think you should make the word experience the centerpiece of your communication. So if you see the energy experience, then you know the three things that exactly. you should expect. Okay, so let's let's, let's let's go back to the the broad spectrum of things that you do, and I, and I'll go back to where you started from. But the first thing I would like to find out: which of the things you do gives you the most fulfillment? What I do as a people developer, I think for me that's the centerpiece of of all my interventions: developing people, getting people to do well, inspiring people to dream, equipping them with skills tools and ideas. That's what inspires me the most. How, how did it begin? Well, so I started life with a strong passion for, for reading. Um, as early as class three, I was reading newspapers. I, was, I remember somewhere in primary school, I think I read the Bible from back to back, reading a lot. And then eventually my passion for reading um, metamorphosed into a passion for wisdom. So I started gathering wise schools, inspirational sayings, and stuff like that. It became more intense after GSS. So I started gathering these quotes. Then when, when I went to secondary school, I started reading inspirational books. So I remember in secondary school from one, I read uh, Yao Pebi's Youth Power, uh, somewhere in from to a chance upon your first book, 10 Commandments of Success. Then I read David Schwartz's Magic of Thinking Big. And I read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So having read those books, I, I became convinced that my, my calling in life 
is to inspire people, is to share ideas, share knowledge, share wisdom that will help people improve their life. Sometimes I'd have, I'd have said that that was my full purpose, but now I know that it was a hint. Because I've come to realize that uh, there are many aspects of me that I've come to discover that I, I didn't used to have. So that's how it started. So way back, I joined a group called Peer Counselors. That was uh, basically the students, the student wing of the school's counseling department. So we used to move, talk to our, our mates, talk to our juniors, and stuff like that. So in secondary school from three, I got the opportunity to make my first public presentation as a speaker at, a, at the Peer Counselors Conference. So when I left secondary school, I mean, the journey began. I started writing letters to churches, to schools, uh, to ask me to come and speak, speak for them. So basically, that's how I started. So if I, if I, if I was asked what was, what was the most important habit that has impacted my life, it will be reading. And I would say that reading will lead you. Because very early, I, I, I started life with a strong sense of destiny, feeling that God had called me to do something unique, to make a contribution, to do something special. But I wasn't sure what it was. But reading led me there. Whilst I read stuff, I read history, I read fiction, I read philosophy, I read, I, I read the World Book Encyclopedia. People who had accomplished great things appealed to me. So I'll go to the Internet Cafe then and read about J. Paul, Paul Getty, William Randolph Hearst, Bill Gates, Mike Adeduga, and print all of these Wikipedia pages out. So as I did that, it gave me a hint about where I had to go with my life and what, what I had to do. What are you looking for? Pardon? What are you looking for? I'm looking for a better Ghana. A better world, but particularly a better Ghana. For me, probably what will give me the greatest fulfillment in life is that in about the next 30 or 35 years, Ghana will be a developed country. I think that if, if that happens, I'll be a fulfilled man. What does a developed country look like? Well, so I would say that a developed country is a country that shows excellence in everything. So excellence in our roads. So we are not dropping litter. Our roads are good quality. Our houses are good. There is infrastructure. Our houses are performing well. Our businesses are, are, are doing well. So for me, that's my idea of a developed country. There should be excellence across many of the key areas of the country's life. You talk about starting out to, to read, and I'm fascinated because reading is something that we, we believe should be the anchor of, of people's lives. And you're saying that it's the one habit that has defined your life the most. And so in the course of your journey, what are some of the key learnings that you'd like to share with our viewers and listeners? So uh, again, I'll emphasize the, the very first lesson that reading will lead you. So I recommend reading to people, especially if you're coming from a disadvantaged background and you're trying to lift yourself up, you're trying to build a great future for yourself, you want to read. Because reading exposes you to a world of possibilities that you don't know existed. You read about people who have done certain great things in life and history, and it will inspire you to believe that you can also make something out of yourself. And reading will expose you to the world. There are many places that I've not been to in the world. I've not been to New York, but I know some suburbs in New York as if I've been there before. So I've, 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 I've Travel countries just by reading. Just by reading. So reading is a good habit to have. The next lesson I would, I would, I would recommend is a lesson of confidence. Confidence will lift you. Because when I began to discover myself, my gift, and my abilities, I had to do something. About this time, I was about just about 18, 19, 20. And I found in myself a desire to inspire people, to encourage people. So I said that I'll start organizing my own conferences. So in 2009, I hosted my very first conference in my alma mater Accra Academy. We called it the Success Skill Set Summit. It was during the vacation period, and we were targeting the vacation school, but vacation school for them, they were only targeting us. So it was very... <laughs> you know, somehow, somehow everybody who does <laughs> events has their first experience, something that they had so much fun for. If I not just events, but business. Yeah. Something they had so much going for. They had done all their feasibility. They thought they were so so much on point and they and fell so badly. It was, it was terrible. How bad was yours? I mean, I mean, it was how many people came to that event? I'm not sure it was even up to ten. I'm not sure it was even up to ten. And that day unfortunately they rain fell. 
I don't even think that the rain fell made much of a difference. But a sport is for more. Maybe if Tony would have showed up, five people came because of the rain. So, and this one was about 2021. 20, probably 20. And then, that was August of 2009. Then, in October 2009, I went to Kaswa and I organized Youth Impact Motivational Conference. That was well attended. I mean, I mean was, the place was full, it overflowed and stuff like that. Eventually, I went on to school to organize Onslaught Motivational Conference, Career Compass, and hosted some of the, I mean, the big names I hosted you in 2010. I hosted at Clevo White, Bernard Able, uh, KSM, Kafuide, and all of those things. Today, when I look back at those years of my life, I wonder, ah, how did I get the confidence to do all of these things? Because when I started hosting motivational conferences to inspire people to succeed, I was just an access graduate. I had no tertiary education. As a matter of fact, I went to speak in Zenith University at a time when I not even bought an university form. I went to speak to university students to inspire them. So, I recognize the importance of confidence. That when you find a gift that God has given you, you must be confident to display the gift, to express the gift, to put the gift to good use. I think that so many people in life behave like pitchers. You know, in university, there are pitchers who don't have hostels who come and live with other people in a hostel. And because they are pitching, they try and play safe. They don't want to speak their minds. They don't want to do anything that will, that will offend their host. They try to be too careful. And too many of us behave like that. So people find their gifts, people find their strengths, but they are afraid to express it. They are afraid to display it. They are afraid to do something that will make them the subject of conversation. But you don't have to live life like, like a pitcher. God gave you a gift for you to use. The Bible says that you are given a gift to be a city set on a hill. And you don't light a lamp and place it under a bushel. You place it on a lampstand. So whatever gift a person has, they have to be confident to express the gift. One, one of the things that prevents them from expressing their gift, their strengths, is very often their weakness. So there's something that God has called you to do or become. But then you're looking at something that you don't have. So I was just an SS graduate with no career achievement, no educational pedigree, nothing. I could have looked at all of those things and said, I don't qualify to go and talk to anybody. But I read a lot. So at least let me share what I've read with people. And it was the beginning of a journey. So I want to just encourage people that believe in what God has called you to do and let it flow. So you've given us two so far, um, apart from your 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 determination to see a better world and a better Ghana. You've particularly spoken about the fact that reading will lead you and confidence will lift will you. Lift you. Um, before I go on to the third, I would like to find out something you mentioned, that people behave like patches out of fear of criticism. You didn't use that word, but people talking about you. Yeah. How have you dealt with criticism in, in your journey? Um, in the early part of my journey, I must confess that I saw criticism as the enemy. And if you come from the kind of disadvantaged background that I come from, when somebody criticizes you, you feel like you should, you should fight back. Uh, why are you trying to tell me that I'm not good enough? And all of those things. But over time, criticism has become my friend. Because I think that confidence is not always an advantage. And it's shocking for me to say this. Confidence is not always an advantage. Confidence can make you cocky. And confidence can make you refuse to listen to things or people that you should listen to. And criticism has helped me tame my confidence. Helped me refine myself. Helped me become better. And I think that that's, a lot of, that's one thing that a lot of us must learn how to deal with. How do we leverage criticism to improve ourselves? To improve our communication? to improve our posture, to improve how we present ourselves. Having run a business for almost a decade, having dealt with people, I think that too many times, people don't like to be criticized. Even when you're giving people friendly feedback to improve their work, there are tendencies often to push back, to fight back, to defend themselves. And I've worked with people at different levels, educated people with a master's degree, or artisans who were half educated, and it, 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 it seems to stretch across the divide. So criticism for me has helped shape me, helped make me better, helped me refine not just the gift, but how the gift is expressed. Let's explore the 
the difficulties of being a CEO. I know it's a subject we've spoken to about off, off air in a couple of our interactions, but running a comms business, a comms and PR business, a design and print entity, running a restaurant, running different entities that you do, and your own publications. What are some of what, what are some of the extremely difficult experiences you've had that you look back on and you're like, wow. <laughs> It, it looked nice from afar, but <laughs> getting in is it, tough. For the benefit of somebody listening who's also, also starting their own own journey. Well, well, in truth, nothing prepares you for being a CEO. Nothing. You know, it's, it's very easy to look at somebody who's a CEO and think that he has a job and I have a job. But I say that you have a job, but a CEO has multiple jobs. So one of the challenges that I've had is having to develop competences in so many areas. Because... Even though I may have a head of HR, I must know HR in order to be able to guide my head of HR to do HR well. I don't have a finance background, but I must learn finance to understand how to manage the cash flow and the equity in my, in my business. I must learn a bit of accounting to understand what the accountant is doing for me. I must learn management. I must learn marketing. I must learn PR. So one of the, probably the biggest challenge for being a CEO is a requirement to be multidisciplinary. So you are always hard pressed for time. You are trying to learn HR, you are trying to learn finance, you are trying to learn accounting, you are trying to learn strategy, you are trying to learn marketing, you're trying to learn sales. So for me, if you ask me, that's, that, that has been my biggest challenge. I know that the cliche or the setup out there for a lot of entrepreneurs is capital that, oh, when you say your biggest challenge, people will say money. Money is a limitation. I agree. But for me, I think that the, the foremost limitation is capacity. Being able to make the right decisions. If you don't build the capacity to understand how a business works, how to manage the various intricacies of a business, no matter how much money you get, you lose it. So my biggest challenge, I would say, is trying to acquire the capacity to become effective at running a business. Perhaps the next one I'll say is managing people. Managing people can be very difficult. Let me give you a very uh, just uh, interesting incident that happened some years ago. In, in a particular month, I wasn't able to pay my staff on time. So salary is delayed for about two or so weeks. And it hadn't happened like that, at least in that season. So when, I, when the salaries were paid, I decided to test all my colleagues and apologize for the delay of the, the salaries and explain to them why it happened and the fact that it don't happen again. I mean, I thought I'd been a top CEO by doing that. My Adipa! Then later, I speak to one of my colleagues and he tells me that, eh, they're insulting you. They're gambling that, eh, JB says that when we want to ask permission, we should call him. We shouldn't test. And he, when he wants to apologize to us, he's testing us. He didn't call us. Hey! <laughs> I mean, for a young person who's trying to manage the ability to manage people, it was ah, <laughs> so it speaks to the fact that people don't see things the way you see them, and we all don't have the same understanding. It can become very difficult in running a business because I say that for every leader, you have a struggle between popularity and performance. What should I do for people to like me, and what should I do for us to be able to achieve our goals? And very often, those two things are apropos each other. So somebody has lost a laptop. Should we forgive him? Or should we punish him for losing the laptop? My answer as a businessman says that, no, let's let people understand that you cannot lose a laptop in an organization. But the person is my friend. <laughs> so how do I do that? So it can create it's a certain balance that every leader has to do. But I assert that performance should always be above popularity. And then Every leader must also try and teach because when I look, about, look back at, at my life, some of the people that I followed who found offense in me, I feel that if they are really taking their time to teach me and help me understand why they expected me to do something and I didn't do it or why something had to be done, it may have helped. But I was rebuked and punished, but I did not really understand why what I did shouldn't have been done. So I recognize the role of the CEO or the leader as a coach. 
that don't just issue instructions, try and explain, try and teach. My experience has taught me that even that one crown may not make a lot of a difference, but that small degree of difference may, get, may make some difference with some people in your team and you can carry them where you want to take them to. This point of engagement, this point about engagement will be applicable to governments, will be applicable to, to parenting, will be applicable to communications. And I'm using engagement, stakeholder engagement, because the sense I get is that what you're simply saying is that you have a viewpoint, others have a, a different viewpoint, and in trying to exercise the power that you have, don't just... Avoid saying, I'm the boss. That's what I'm saying. So let's do it. Take time to... And talk, talk, talking about that, there's int an interesting development um, in Christian circles, in parenting circles, where the young people are asking questions and you just can't say do it because i say so you need to break it down and then they will ask you follow-up questions and that is it's good that assertiveness is good because it shows that they are not just embracing things for the sake of it and that's yeah. one of the brilliant things the young people are doing today all right let me let me um, end the segment on the note of diversification you've done so many things and you still are doing a number of things. Why? Um, it's a subject I've thought about uh, very intensely because, I mean, you that I look up to as a mentor has been more focused in what you do. At some point, I had to ask myself the question whether that was me or not. But I've come to a conclusion that I'm not a specialist. I mean, for many years, I had a lot of debate with my peers about specialization and generalization. You remember, you remember the, that big debate when Vikram Masharamani from Yale came to the Festival of Ideas and, 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 and spoke about the subject? And it's been a big debate till now. Exactly. So, so you, you, are, you, are, you think you are not a specialist? I'm not a specialist. I'm a generalist. I, I thrive on variety. I thrive on being able to do something. So... I, I'm excited by the fact that maybe right after this interview, I'm meeting my chefs to discuss what our market list for next week is. Right after that interview, I'm meeting my sales department to discuss their reports, their reports and their plans for, for, the, for the coming week. Do, that's what excites me. I live on variety, the excitement, the chase. Monotony bores me. So I don't think that you know, there, are some, there are some speakers who specialize in, on, on some topics or some themes. I could never specialize. I'll be bored. I like being able. So sometimes I even ask my, 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 my host, give me a topic. I want to challenge him by giving me a topic that I've never done before. So I have to push me to think, to develop new ideas. So at the base of my desire to diversify is basically doing something that fits my temperament, that fits my, my nature, that I want something that will keep me going. If I get bored, I'll lose momentum. So that is it. But then the other part of it too is strategic. My belief is that markets are small. So for example, one of our companies is a publishing company. There's a, limit, there's, a, there's a limit on how big the publishing business can be. There's a limit on how many people will publish a book. So if I'm trying to create wealth, I can't create wealth through one company. Whatever I do, the market has a size. And there's only so much that I can accomplish in that market. So why don't I explore businesses or opportunities in other markets? So if I want to make $10 million or $1 million and I make $500,000 from, from about five different markets, then it accumulates into the major picture of trying to create wealth. So that's what I'm trying to do. This is springboard your venture investing. What I'm trying to do is distill the lessons from my guest for today, Jeremiah Buabing. I've known Jeremiah for, for a couple of decades and We've, we've, we've traveled this country, gone as far as Wa, 701 kilometers away, just doing what we do. And he's one of my favorite um, emerging speakers and young leaders in business. And we talk a lot, bounce ideas a lot, and have great, great expectations of him. Jeremiah, you've been sharing your lessons so far. And my summary, one, reading will lead you. Two, confidence will lift you. The third one was about criticism. You said it was initially your enemy and it's now your friend. The fourth is about business leadership. You say nothing prepares you for the life of a CEO. And the fifth 
is about diversification. 